And welcome back, my friends, to yet another episode of Everyday Truth. Looking forward to diving into uh, our chapter for the day, which is 1 John chapter 5, if you want to find your uh, find your place there. Uh, and we're in verse number 3, and we're kind of on that same theme. You know, what we believe about Christ is going to inform the way we behave toward other people. And in that the, the whole context of loving God and loving others, uh, we're in verse number three. So let's let's jump uh, right there if we can. It says, for this is the love of God. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Well, what, what does loving God look like doing what he says? For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So let's just take a moment here, John. We could spend the entire podcast on this one thought. But when the Bible says that we're to love God and do what he says, and what he tells us to do is not grievous. It's it's not like, oh, I've got to obey God. Oh, what a drudgery. You know, God is just holding me back. And what a, you know, what a legalistic God we serve. And all the fun is out there outside of the fence. I mean, what, what does this verse mean? Yeah, I, I, when you say that, Pastor, my mind was going to some people I've known in my past who, you know, think that God is a killjoy. You know, that God doesn't want you to have any fun in life. You know, God is the one who designed life. God is the creator. He's the one who gives us life more than anyone else in the universe. God knows how life is best lived. And that's why God tells us how we ought live, because God knows we only will find true satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, and the list could go on. We only will find all those things in Jesus Christ, in God, if we obey God and keep his commandments. Jesus Christ's burden truly is light, as he talks about in Matthew chapter 11. But the world paints such a different picture that the only way to truly enjoy life is to go out, you know, live it up, party, but that is not the way to live life. So God warns us about breaking his commandments and living outside of his parameters in a couple ways in the word of God. Number one, he just warns us through commandments like this and the commandments of God themselves. Proactively, he warns us. And wise is that person that by faith believes what God says and takes God's word for it. Uh, I, I think it's wise for us when we get counsel to take someone's word for it, especially when they speak with authority. But God also includes in his word other ways by which this truth is underscored. For instance, the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible is really Solomon's testimony of, you know, I don't know that I really believe my dad. Because Proverbs, m- many of the Proverbs that Solomon received are, are Proverbs he learned from his own father, right? Proverbs chapter three. And Solomon said, you know, so what I did with all of my resources is I decided to kind of put this to a test. And so I lived that life and I went outside of God's commandments. I stepped beyond the fence and I experienced all the things that I wasn't supposed to experience. And now at the end of my life, I'm saying, wow, it was pretty empty. And I really wish I hadn't done that. And what I learned is what I was told as a young man, and that is I should have just feared God and kept his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. You know, Adam and Eve learned this. God put them in a garden and said, okay, here's a wonderful place for you. Enjoy it. It's paradise. Now, don't eat from this. So he gave them a commandment, a prohibition commandment. What did they do? They said, okay, we want to step outside of God's commands. What did they learn? They learned that God was right and we were wrong. And it's, it's experience keeps a dear school, but a fool will learn by no other. And so when the Bible says that we are to love God and keep his commandments, this is not a grievous thing. God is saying, not only have I given you a wonderful relationship and a wonderful opportunity I have loved you enough to show you where the fence lines are so that you don't get in danger of forfeiting the benefits that I give you by my love. As you talk, Pastor, about the decisions God has given us and how God has directed us what we ought to do, my mind went to the Old Testament, to the wilderness wandering, to children of Israel. You know, those, of course, those things were written for our admonition that we might learn from them. And they made some bad decisions. We all know that. We won't recount the whole history today. But in Deuteronomy 30, Moses is about to die. And Moses talks to them and says, I said before you life and death, mm. you know, blessing and cursing. But he says, you know, choose, choose life. 
And he says, and this is not a vain thing. This is you and your children. Moses knows these people have seen how God has acted with the children of Israel in the last, you know, many decades. And he says, I want you to learn to choose life choose blessing and we find that same concept throughout mm. the word of god pastor where god says you have two choices you know choose life or death choose good or evil blessing or cursing choose me or your own desire but god wants to bless us and god wants us to choose the way that is best and he outlines that for us there is no question what the best way is and god wants us to follow him and what a joy it is yeah look at verse number four where um uh, let me see yes verse number four four so when you see the word for in the Bible, it's going to give you a reason. It's going to answer a question. It's going to answer the question because. So in verse number three, it's got, we, ought, we, uh, we ought to keep his commandments. Uh, this is the love of God. This is what demonstrates or, or um, illustrates our love for God when we, when we do what he says. And what he says is not grievous for us to do. For whatsoever is born of God. Okay, so that would be you. And that would be me if you know Christ is your Savior. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So there, there's a, there's a, 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 there's a, a very uh, theological truth here, but there's also a very practical truth here. So what, what is it by which we have overcome the world, the sway of the world, uh, the grip of the world? Uh, the destiny of the world, which is a Christless eternity in hell, uh, we overcome the world by our faith. But when we have faith in the fact that God accomplished for us upon the cross what we could not accomplish for ourselves, uh, that he provides for us what we could not have provided for ourselves, and that is eternal salvation, the gift of eternal life. So we overcome by our faith. But then, John, there's a very practical sense here in which our living and abiding faith is the way by which we live in victory over the world. So Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. So we not only are saved in that one moment when you trusted Christ as your Savior by faith, but we live every day, moment by moment, by faith in the Son of God. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Your, your hope for spiritual victory today is when you live in the reality of who you are in Christ. Your hope for spiritual victory today is when you live in the reality that this world is not my home, that there is eternity, that there is an unseen world, that there is a value in living for then and not now. Really, when we keep our faith in view, there is a God and there is a future and there is a judgment seat and there is eternity. And there, when that is what helps us to live in victory. That's the impetus by which we can live in a world that is t telling us an entirely different message, in a society that's telling us that we are missing out, that there's more beyond the fence. No, what gives us the victory and the assurance is our faith. And I think if I thought the word of God, Pastor, faith is emphasized over and over again. Of course, Hebrews 11 is a well-known chapter. I think of the book of Galatians, where Paul is dealing with an issue where the people in Galatia are thinking, well, we were saved by grace through faith, but now we have to work to earn something, to mm -hmm. earn favor with God. But Paul argues a lot about faith and grace in the book of Galatians. And I love Galatians 2.20, a very well-known verse. You know, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And time and again, the Bible comes back to that we have to live by faith. That is the reason why the word of God is so important for us. I think in Romans 10, how that faith come up by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The Christian who is not in the word of God is not going to be living the kind of life that he or she ought be living because all these things go part and parcel together. You know, the word of God, the Christian maturation, faith, the grace of God. God wants us to be complete in Jesus Christ. That's so good. Um, look at verse number five. So they are of the, I'm sorry, I'm reading, I'm reading verse five of chapter four, my, my bad. Look at verse five of chapter five. Who is he? that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So again, 
back to the basis of faith because faith must have an object. And the object of our faith is not the word of God per se, uh, but the word of God as it relates to Jesus. Because remember that the, the word of God is a testimony of Jesus Christ. It is the story of God's redemptive plan uh, personified by culminating in the work of Jesus. So wh- where does our faith lie? Our faith lies in what we believe about Jesus. And we've, we've talked about this, that he is uh, the, the son of God. He is all God. He is all man. He is God's revelation to man. He is our only hope. He's the way, the truth, the life. We could go on and on. Look at verse number six. This is he, Jesus, that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. Sometimes our Catholic friends try to ma- manipulate this verse and make it to mean you know, that, that we need to be baptized as babies and receive the Eucharist. I don't know how they get that out of this, but it's a classic case of eisegesis reading into the Bible what's not there. But the Bible says, and it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. So Jesus came by water and by blood. And I'm not going to lie, John, this is a much ballyhooed verse. Uh, there are numbers of different interpretations and, and it's a difficult one. But really, when you when you wade through the interpretations and and really consider them next to what the Bible says harmonistically, it, it really it's really not that difficult to understand. So, John, you and I talked about it a little bit before uh, today's podcast, but and we agree, which is the important <laughs> thing. So, listen, folks, if, if John and I agree, this has got to be true. Uh, so, John, uh, explain to our listeners when the Bible says that Jesus came by water and blood. You know, w- what does that mean in your opinion? You know, as you look in Scripture, you're right, Pastor. This is much debated about this. But look at the ministry of Jesus. And remember, John is dealing with with Christological controversies. We've talked about it time and again throughout this epistle. He's dealing with many different errors about Christ. And we've seen them. We discussed them. And right here, I believe that John is dealing with an error that said that, you know, Jesus was not really the Christ his whole life. At his baptism, the Christ came upon him, but before he died, the Christ left him. I believe John is simply referring to the water, his baptism, his water baptism, his blood, his death, that from beginning to end, he was the Christ. He never stopped being the Christ because that's who he is. And so I believe that John is testifying with this. And by the way, the people in John's day would have known well what John was saying. You know, now people often debate about it, but I think he was talking about You know, at the baptism, Jesus was baptized. The father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I think at the death of Christ, because of what happened when Christ died, the Roman centurion even said, truly, this was the son of God. You would have found from his baptism to his death, there were articulations that he is the son of God. Yeah, father into thy hands I commend my spirit, which is the last thing Jesus said on the cross, a testimony to the relationship between father and son. You know, the other thing that I think really speaks to this, John, is of all the disciples, so John obviously is the last one living here as he writes the book of 1 John, but of all the disciples, only John was at both of these events. So think about John was one of the first followers. He and Andrew had followed John the Baptist. So he uh, presumably would have been there at the baptism of Jesus at at Bethabara uh, there in, uh, well, it's mentioned in several of the gospels. But then also we know that John was the only one that showed up at the cross because Jesus said, son, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son. And Jesus gave the care of his own mother to, to John there at the cross. So I find it interesting that John would then reference that here. So what am I saying? I'm saying certainly there's, there's a great theological truth here. And I agree with John that this would refer to the totality of Jesus' ministry, beginning at the baptism, ending with really it is finished, ending there at the cross, n- knowing that the, 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 the burial and resurrection would come and the ascension, not downplaying that, but saying that as far as Jesus, the work that he came to do, the work that was assigned to him by the Father was the work of that public ministry. And this is he that came by water and blood. He fulfilled the ministry that God had given him to do. But I think there's also this very personal 
part of it where John is saying, you know, and I was there. It's kind of like chapter one. We, we beheld him. We, we, we held him. Uh, the, our hands have handled him. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's a wonderful testimony that John gives. Look at uh, verse, and we're out of time. So let me just say uh, verse number six and um, the latter part of the verse it is the Spirit, notice the capital S, talking about the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit that beareth witness because of the Spirit of truth. So John is saying, you know, not only am I testifying of this, not only am I teaching this uh, verbatim, giving you the words, but uh, believers have the indwelling Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God confirms these things in our heart. The Spirit of God validates the truth of God. It's the Spirit of God that uses the Word of God to make children of, children of God more like the Son of God. We're going to come back to the Spirit's part in all of this next episode. We're way out of time. So thanks for taking the extra time with us today. Looking forward to jumping into verse number 7 tomorrow. Until then, have a great day in the Lord. God bless you, my friends.